You know, I'm not from the South, so pimento cheese, I don't know. You know, I think it's pretty good, though. Mm. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's what I like to hear. <laughs> Delicious. I'm Robin Sussingham, and this is The Zest. Citrus, seafood, Spanish flavor, and southern charm. The Zest celebrates cuisine and community in the Sunshine State. Edna Lewis helped define refined southern cooking for generations. And her cookbook from the 1970s, The Taste of Country Cooking, is considered an American classic. We talk about one of her newly reissued cookbooks and her legacy. Plus, you've been invited to dinner. Yay! But you can't show up empty-handed. We've got some ideas for food gifts that anybody would love. It's all coming up on The Zest. Trail Funch is a lifestyle blogger and event stylist based in Tampa. As a transplant from Connecticut and from Bucks County, Pennsylvania, Crail likes to mix that classic New England sophistication with Southern chic. She's the author of the book, An Appealing Plan, A Year of Everyday Celebrations. Crail Funch, thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. This is fun to be here. So I think we're going to talk about hostess gift ideas that yes. are food related. Yes, which is so fun. I think there's so many fun um, options that you can have. So it can be food related, but it can also be entertaining that like links back into food. And, um, you know, obviously, we all bring a bottle of wine or two to an event. Usually, I always I like to bring champagne because it's a little bit more fun. And um, it's always appropriate for whatever occasion. But but, but but do you feel like you have to bring expensive champagne? Because no, good one, question. Do yeah, you have to spend at least I, $50 for it. To no, I would. Well, <laughs> a bottle I of wine, on, you could get a good bottle of wine for a lot less than that. Agreed. Um, I think it depends depends upon who the host or hostess is that you know, you know, if it's a if it's a work colleague, you might need to up your game a little bit. But if it's a friend, most people are not going to worry that much about it. But um, kava is a good um, option because uh, as a little side tip, not many people know a lot of kava labels. So it's a, you know, you can kind of kind of uh, maneuver that a little bit and keep your budget in on track. <laughs> yes, very smart. <laughs> yes. So some other uh, sort of outside of the quote unquote box or bottle. Options might be a cocktail shaker. If you know your friend is really into making fun cocktails, mm-hmm. um, you know, think about his or her uh, style preference. So you might g- go with like a copper um, cocktail shaker or something, you know, really retro if that's their style oh, also. Wow. So that's kind of fun addition to their bar. Oh, you I, can you could put some like mixes with that could, too. Yes, like, put that all together yeah. like a little right. Gift. So all of these you can make a big package, or you could just present it as one thing. Mm-hmm. So which I think is fun. So again, if you know if you're going just for a cocktail party, mm-hmm. um, you know a shaker is just appropriate. But if you're going for a whole weekend, you might want to include you know some of the spirits and some of the mixers to go along with it. You know, say so you're going to um, bottle of olives, maybe exactly. Yeah, that yeah. could be See? really yeah. fun. Mm-hmm. Right. Or you but can how mix do you make it together. look pretty, Crail? Because that's always my thing. So yeah. then you put it in a basket, and then you're supposed <laughs> to you wrap some sort of cellophane. Right. I don't know that it ends up looking right. like a third Stay grader did it. Stay away from the uh, cellophane. <laughs> Although I mean, I know the basket. You know, if you're mm-hmm. doing a basket, but um, I lean always lean a little bit towards the natural side and keep things clean and pretty and, mm-hmm. and just appropriate. So if you wanted to do it, you could just do a little bag. Um, if the a lot of packaging these days is really, really pretty. I think that's how they get our attention. So, um, you know, don't feel like you need to, you know, wrap it and make it, but stick a bow on top of it or, you know, something like that. So don't feel like you have to go all out and present this huge, um, you know, like you said, cellophane, crinkly, really loud thing. Okay. <laughs> Another addition could be um, honey flights, So, um, which are great for cocktails, but also for cheese, um, uh, you know, cheese trays. So they, um, I've seen different um, selections. So there might be a wildflower honey, there might be a um, lavender honey, all packaged together. That's a great idea. Or you can make your own. I make my own lavender infused honey, and that makes a really nice gift also. And you just um, can use organic culinary lavender buds and kind of uh, warm those together with the honey just over a low, low heat, and then strain it out and then just put it in a little cute little, you know, ramekin or even a ball jar or something like that. 
And that would be called lavender honey. Lavender infused, infused honey. honey. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's a great idea. Yeah. Anything else you could infuse honey with if you wanted to make a flight and one of them was... Yeah. Lavender infused. Right. Anything else? So um, recently I had, which would be really fun, is t- it is like a spicy honey. So I'm not sure exactly what they use, but you could, you know, you could use like a chipotle or a jalapeno or something like that and just infuse that. You might well just soak that. I don't know about the heat on that. You probably just would just soak it. And then that would add a little spice to it. Again, that would be great with cheese or um, cocktails or if someone liked a little spice in there, iced tea. You could use that for to kind of add a sweetness great. to your iced tea. Great idea. Yeah, just something different. You you could make again. You could make it at home, or you could purchase it. Um, along those similar lines, um, think about um, some made homemade simple syrup or compound butter is a really nice thing. So especially if you're going somewhere where you know you're gonna have corn on the cob, making a compound butter with um, maybe tarragon. So you just uh, allow the butter to soften to room temperature. Add some uh, chopped tarragon or your favorite herb into that. Then kind of mix it together and then roll it or form whatever form that you want it to be in and then let it chill overnight not in the freezer just in the regular fridge and then that makes a really nice hostess gift as well so, so Creole, how would you present that though to someone because i could just see yeah <laughs> someone a blob, <laughs> a of, blob of butter of, of remelted butter <laughs> you know i that's yeah. my fear is that right. they won't know this is something really right. cool right know? agreed and you, you don't want them to just put it out on the table you know mm-hmm. and then it doesn't get used or melts even worse right mm-hmm. so um always if you're making something homemade always put a little label or a tag on it, you know, made with love or something like that made from the kitchen and put exactly what it is. And if it's something that needs to be refrigerated, make sure you tell your host or hostess when you're handing it to them that this will need to be refrigerated or you might want to serve this now. But in terms of presentation, I've made it um, uh, sometimes in those silicone ice molds that you see. So those come in different shapes. You can do it in squares. You can do it in hearts or, you know, whatever the occasion might be. And so those those you can just pop out and, you know, if you wanted to put it on a platter or something for them. I've also just made rolls of it and I've just done that with um, parchment paper. So you just sort of form like a little log and roll it with the parchment paper. Mm-hmm. Um, you could put, you know, some ribbons or some tie, like maybe some twine on the end and again, mm-hmm. put your little note of what it actually is and the date that it was made. Oh, great yeah. idea. Yeah. And so other great gifts, you know, if you know your host or hostess is a gardener, uh, maybe a potted um, a plant or uh, with a lot of different herbs. So you could put rosemary, parsley, a lot of common herbs in there or a citrus tree. So those are great in Florida. You know, they grow really well in a pot. It doesn't have to be planted in the garden and it can just sit on a patio. So it depends. Think about your host and what they might like. What they like. Mm-hmm. I like the idea of the simple syrup because they sell that in the grocery store. They and I, I kind of always think, who would buy? <laughs> but, but then I went over to a friend's house, and there she had it sitting on the counter. Right, right. It's just, you know, well, equal yeah, parts sugar and right. water. Absolutely. And then you can infuse it with mint to make right. your mojitos. Mint and iced tea. It's great for mint. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Iced tea you can yep. do, too, if you mm-hmm. don't feel like having a mojito right at the moment. Right. <laughs> <laughs> But that's a good idea. And you could put that a pretty little picture or something like that Mm -hmm. to put that in. Yes. Yeah. Great idea. And, um, you know, again, you can do that with really anything. Um, Any kind of berries or stone fruit or like a peach infused um, simple syrup. And like you said, it's so, so simple. (laughs) And that needs to be refrigerated. It would. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, but and they I've kept mine for two weeks. They recommend, you know, only a day or two, but I've kept mine for two weeks or even sometimes even longer. But as long as it's refrigerated and it doesn't start to get cloudy, as soon as it gets cloudy, you need to to get rid of it. What about bringing a cast, a whole meal? Is that too presumptuous? Because they already might have Right. Your, the meal's planned. Yeah. So um, a couple other thoughts of mine all, along those lines are I wouldn't bring a casserole unless, again, you're going for the weekend and you know that you would be eating it. You're adding to, um, you know, some meal over the course of that weekend for like a dinner party or a cocktail thing. And they may have already had everything planned. I would check with your host on that. But something also might be um, like you're saying casserole, but maybe a um, salad bowl and salad tongs. So I'm a really attractive one. You could bring your salad in that if you know you're bringing a salad and then the bowl and the servers become your gift. Oh, nice. Or a cheese board. You know, I love those. I would love to receive any of this. <laughs> <laughs> Just invite me over. I'll bring them all. Yes. Bring them all. <laughs> really nice ideas. Yeah. yeah. So a cheese board uh, with cutters. Um, you know, some of the marble ones are really beautiful. Again, so it's a little bit, maybe a little higher price point. But the wood boards with a nice wood cutters filled with cheese and, you know, some of these honeys, et cetera, um, is a really, really nice offering to your hostess as well as as a gift. 
Well, those are some great ideas. That's going to keep us busy um, getting ready for our weekends with our hosts and hostesses. So, Crail, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Great ideas. Appreciate it. Crail Funch is a lifestyle and entertaining consultant based in Tampa. You'll find her recipes for infused simple syrup and compound butter on our website, thezestpodcast.com. The late Edna Lewis was born in 1916 and raised on her grandfather's land in Freetown, Virginia. He was an emancipated slave who was part of the group that founded that town. Edna took off on her own as a teenager, eventually becoming co-owner of a New York City restaurant popular with celebrities before writing several cookbooks on Southern cooking. Edna was inducted into the James Beard Cookbook Hall of Fame, and in 2014, she was one of five culinary professionals celebrated on U.S. postage stamps for introducing America to regional and international cooking. The Zest contributor Janet Keeler tells us that the woman who celebrated farm-to-table cooking decades before it was trendy is every bit as relevant today. We're talking about Edna Lewis today, the cookbooks In Pursuit of Flavor. Now, this cookbook came out in 1988, I believe, but it has been, it was reissued this year. This year, right. right. Okay, so what's special about it? I don't know if there's a resurgence of interest in Edna Lewis, and um, you know, she's not widely as widely known as some other sort of seminal uh, chefs and cookbook authors in the country, but her story is so wonderful that just people, you know, especially in the South and especially chefs, they just really love her. You know, she was born um, in Freetown, Virginia, the the granddaughter of an emancipated slave who was part of the group that that founded that little community. So she was born there in 1916, but she left there. Well, she was in her she was a teenager moved to Washington, D.C., and then on to New York City, where she had a restaurant. So most of her life, because she died at 89, most of her life was spent in New York City. Um, She had a cookbook, or she had a, she had a restaurant there called the uh, Cafe Nicholson, which was popular with people like Truman Capote, Eleanor Roosevelt. um, Who else went there? Marlon Brando was there. Marlon Brando. Yes. So how cool. So she, she went to New York City, um, somehow got in with this uh, Nicholson, um, which I'm not sure what his other, if he was already a chef, but anyway, they started this restaurant together. They were she was right. a co-owner. Right. Um, I mean, v- that's very unusual. You think for an African American woman in that in the 40s? In the 40s, but started was just cooking her own food that she grew up making, like simple Southern food, and people went crazy for it because I guess they weren't, you know, there wasn't so much of that in New York City at the time. It's it's a, such a great story, and like you said. She's kind of a legend among people who know food. Um, I had read that another book of hers, um, tell me what it's called. The Taste of Country Cooking, maybe? The Taste of Country Cooking yes. is a standard for yes. professional chefs. Right, right. And she's inspired so many others. In fact, earlier, I think last year, a book came out that was a, it's a collection of essays that people have, most, and a lot of women have written about her and what she meant to them. So her her. You know, the tentacles of her genius are just, you know, are all over the place. She died in 2006. Yes, at 89. Mm-hmm. So it's been a while. I guess they reissued this book because there is um, a resurgence of interest in that kind of cooking. And what they, I, I heard it described as refined Southern cooking, um, not necessarily. She was from Virginia. So it's a different cuisine in the deep south i i think i'd read that she, like she didn't cook with collard greens um, right you right. know there were certain things that you think of as soul food or you know a traditional african-american soul food or southern cooking um that it's, hers is a little different yeah i think we do have a very specific idea of southern cooking and it's fried chicken and greens and macaroni and cheese maybe uh these days you know chicken and waffles and uh, uh, shrimp and grits and that mm-hmm. kind of thing, depending yep. on where in the South you're from. But um, she, you know, if you think about it, so many, so many African Americans that grew up in the South were cooking for all kinds of people, mostly white people, and they were learning to cook some of the food that they ate. So you know, she knew how to make a souffle. She knew how to make a lot of things. But she is a home. She was a home cook, and that's what's really most interesting about her because she, 
She knows food. She knows what it should taste like, what it should look like, when it's at its peak in season. And that's, I think, one of the beauties of this book and her other books is the wonder she had for seasonality. That's that's really exciting for, for really a good ingredients. Yeah, and I, I think she had she kind of bemoaned sometimes that she couldn't find vegetables or greens that tasted as good as she remembered them tasting on her farm because she grew up on a farm right. in Virginia. Right. And 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 she talks about in all her cookbooks that wonderful feeling of, you know, w- walking home, walking into the yard and seeing the raspberries starting to to come. Oh. And then she knew what was coming. You know, pies and all these and and jam and all these kinds of things and that of course they would be at their peak of flavor and of course we don't really as much as we'd like to have that. It's hard to have it now. It's hard to have, but that's and her writing is so, uh, it's so clear and pretty about how she felt about food, but then how to cook it. So I think for a cook, it's very helpful, even if you can't um, find the exact things that she's talking about. Uh, it it just reminds you of cooking is not to me. It's not as easy as people like to make it sound. You know, they always say, "Well, if you can read, you can cook," and I'm like, "Well." Not necessarily, because if she has a recipe that has tomatoes in it, and I my tomatoes may be juicier than the one she... You have to know something. You know, you have to know the way things look. And this kind of reminded, you know, learning about her kind of reminded me of when I spoke with Rick Bragg, and he talked about learning yeah. to, to cook from his mother, right. who never wrote down a recipe, never right. read uh, from a cookbook, but she knew her techniques were tried and true. She knew how things were supposed to look and smell. She knew when something was done because of the way it smelled. And I think Edna Lewis... She, they said she could hear when things were ready. That's so interesting uh-huh. that you say that because I marked this passage in her, on her coconut layer cake with lemon filling. And she says, she, I use a cake tester, but I also listen to the sounds of the cake after it has cooked for 25 minutes. When it is still baking and not yet ready, the liquids make a bub- bubbling noises. Just as the cake is done, the sound becomes faint and weak, but they should disappear. That's perfect, right? Because everybody's oven is a little different, and you need to know what's supposed to be happening to the food, you know? But I don't think we think of that so much. We don't know as much. We don't get to sit there at somebody like this at their knee and learn how to cook. So she's written it down for us. Yeah, that's the beauty of it. That's it. That's That's the beauty of it. mm -hmm. And I think that's the kind of thing that... Maybe I'm never going to make that coconut layer cake, but I might make a chocolate cake. I might make another kind. And when you have those tips, you can use them. I can you start can thinking that things. way. Yeah, right. start thinking right. about it. So um, tell me what you brought today. I don't want to wait any longer. Jim. Okay, okay. <laughs> I want to eat. Well, this is interesting. Uh-huh. So I have I actually made something out of another book that she did, The Gift of Southern Cooking, mm. she, that was written with, with her and Scott Peacock. So Scott Peacock is another acclaimed Southern chef, much younger than her, and was her assistant on a few things. And she ended up living with him about the last 10 years of her life in Atlanta. He was kind of her caretaker yes, at the end. Yes, and he's such a, he's, he's a, he's a really delightful, Delightful guy. And he wrote this cookbook with her, with her um, mostly in his voice. And so I actually made the pimento cheese mm-hmm. out of here, which is a pretty standard southern dish. You know, people, they love their pimento cheese. You know, they use it on all kinds of things and uh, grilled cheese sandwiches and everything. But this recipe calls for you roast the red peppers yourself. You can always buy canned pimentos, but or jarred. Um, so I did that. And then this calls for homemade mayonnaise which I made. And it has a completely different taste because mayonnaise really is dressing. You made the mayonnaise for I did make the mayonnaise. Good for you. And, um, you know, mayonnaise calls for two egg yolks, which are raw. Did it turn out good? It did turn out good. It wasn't a ton of work. But Mm -hmm. because the egg yolks are raw, I like to use pasteurized eggs. So we know Mm -hmm. that they're, you know, that they've... that that there's no chance of bacteria and everything because I think that that can be kind of a concern, especially for... You know, little kids or older people or people who have, you know, other kinds of illnesses. So um, the problem is with pasteurized eggs is they're at least double the cost of regular eggs. But mm. I think it's worth it occasionally for something like this. you're going to be eating them raw, it's a good yeah. idea. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, so here's the here's some pimento cheese. I got some. Describe describe what that looks like. So, so the pimento is roasted red pepper. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you can use those canned ones, but why? You know, you can roast them yourself. Mm-hmm. So this recipe Describe calls it. for this recipe calls for um, extra sharp white cheese for the flavor, and then just kind of medium mild whatever yellow cheese for the for the um, 
for the color. So you, it almost looks a little confetti-ish. You know, you shred it and then mix it together. Some people do it in a, in a food processor, so it's almost like a paste kind of thing, but I, I think that kind of ruins the look of it. It looks a little more festive. It's and then ri- got sort of red, red, white, and orange. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like right. confetti, you're right. Right. And then it's got the flecks of the, um, of the red peppers in mm-hmm. there. So, I, I, you know, oh, and it has a little cayenne. I didn't go overboard on that. So it's got a little bit of heat to it and a little bit of salt and some mayonnaise, and that's kind of it. I, I feel like it's a little bit like, you know, for people who make pimento cheese, it's a little like potato salad. You know, yours is different than mine, and mom makes it like this, and this is how we're used to it. So I think it's one of those kind of dishes that people don't use recipes for. You just kind of throw it together. It's a simple recipe. How did you – did you just buy the shredded cheese? No, I shredded it myself. The problem with shredded cheese to me – and it's not like I've never used pre-shredded cheese. Mm -hmm. But once the cheese is shredded and air hits it, it starts to – the flavor starts to go. Mm -hmm. So I I always shred it myself, Mm -hmm. which I think it's not – doesn't take – it's not that big of a deal. Okay, so it's so it's the homemade mayonnaise. Homemade which mayonnaise she get, using her recipe for homemade mayonnaise. Yes. Okay. Yes. The pimento, white cheese, and then a medium yellow cheddar. Uh huh. And I just used you know a store brand. I didn't use any big expensive kind. You know, at some point, I think if you're covering it with mayonnaise and other kinds of things, <laughs> I don't right. think we need to buy like <laughs> the most expensive you know cheese yeah. in the world. A little bit of black pepper. That's it. That's it. And so you can do it on crackers. You know, it's kind of standard to do it with um, uh, celery. Yeah. So uh, to me, that's kind of a refreshing little little dip and stuff. We, we tested it. We, we tested it at home and it got the thumbs up. All right. Here, you take some too. You know, I'm not from the South. So pimento cheese, I don't know. You know, I think it's pretty good though. Mm. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that's what I like to hear. <laughs> Delicious. Well... What good. a good snack. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can't say anything bad about this. If you like cheese. Right. That's the only thing. If you don't like cheese, but then you have to move on down the potluck <laughs> table. <laughs> yeah. And it's all, and the creaminess. Yeah. And it's perfect on the celery. Janet, this is a great recipe. This is for the bridge party. Exactly. Exactly. The ladies who lunch, right? Mm-hmm. Or want to nibble. That's a, that's a great, great comment. <laughs> That is delicious. Yeah, right. I, I think it's I think it's a great recipe, and it's an, it's an easy recipe, and makes me think of Edna and Scott and just all those things that all that all that stuff that's come before, and 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 such a wonderful, interesting person. So, Janet, give oh. me an idea of of Edna Lewis's style. Um, give me an idea of some of her. What are some of her most famous dishes? What is she known for? I think a lot of these desserts, you know, she made, she was a great pie baker. So she has good recipes for like blackberry and boysenberry pie, uh, you know, her pastry dough, those kinds of things. But she really, she really was a great, um, she was a great dessert maker. And the celebration of the of the fresh ingredients are really, are really important. And also the breadth of it. I'm not sure until she came along, what people knew about Southern cooking was probably very limited that's what I'm thinking, that when she issued these books in the 70s and 80s, people didn't think of Southern cooking as something you really needed a cookbook for, probably. No. And you know? No. And if you were from other, other places in the country, you probably had very limited knowledge. And I think, you know, Southern cooking, part of the reason they've reissued this, Southern cooking is huge everywhere. It's, it's, it's big now. Yeah, I go, you know, when I go home to California, if we go into San Francisco, I'm like, what do they know here with chicken and waffles? I mean, there's all kinds of places that serve yeah. those kinds of things. But I would say, I, I, I mean, I shouldn't draw that big, you know, the big brush over it. But I would say a lot of it is sort of, you know, the cliched stuff. Not so much this, not so much. And I, I have friends out West who think it's all just fried Bad for you kind of food. Well, and she didn't do so much of the fried things. I no, there's think. not a fried chicken recipe in here. There's I don't not. Think. I don't think so. In the pursuit of flavor. Mm-mm. And I also want to mention for the gift of Southern cooking, her editor was the famous Judith Jones, right? Right. Who right. was Julia Child's cookbook editor? Right. She um, also edited the you know the Anne Frank book. Diary of Anne Frank. Yes, that was her first big thing. She was fabulous. Yeah, and this book apparently, I mean, when she started working on Edna's books, really changed the way she looked at Southern cooking. And she was she was one too who thought it was, you know, this kind of regional, 
isn't it cute, but slightly bad for you food, that it didn't really, it could be sophisticated. And when you look at these recipes, I wouldn't say they're particularly hard, but they take some effort. Mm -hmm. And they are in, I know for Judith Jones, it was very important that they should be in the voice of Edna Lewis. Right. She didn't want them to be in her voice or anybody else. Um, she wanted them to be in Edna Lewis's voice and for, for, the, for the gift of Southern cooking. Well, we've been talking about two Edna Lewis books, The Gift of Southern Cooking, and then In Pursuit of Flavor, which was first issued in 1988 and just reissued this year. So really worth taking a look back at the legend, Edna Lewis. Thank you so much, Janet. This has been really interesting. You're welcome. I hope you enjoy the rest of that pimento cheese. Oh, I will. <laughs> no sharing. so much for listening. You can find recipes from our stories at thezestpodcast.com. And if you missed last week's show, we've got the full story on Cafe Con Leche, plus tips to making the perfect pie crust. I'm Robin Sussingham. Dalia Colon and I produce The Zest with help from Megan Trimble, Mark Hayes, and Craig George. The Zest is a production of WUSF Public Media.